Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as usual, on behalf of Alice and myself and all of the folks at Bible Talk, we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and tell you that we're blessed that you can join us, to be with us in this time in the Word. And as I say so often, I would much rather be face to face with you, but we, we are blessed to have what we have with today's technology. We're continuing on in our study of the prayer, the model of prayer that Jesus taught the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, commonly called the Our Father. All right? Last week we talked about what a joy it is, what a blessing it is, what a privilege it is that we can call him Father. Yes. Those of us who are his who are indeed led by the Spirit, the children of God, we can call him Father. We can cry out with, because the Spirit causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. We're going to continue on in this, and we're going to start by looking at that phrase. And we're, Yes, we're going to look at this word by word, phrase by phrase, because the Lord has so much for us to learn here. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. And Father, we do. We, just, we say, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. Your name is blessed, Lord God. And we come before you and we ask, Lord God, that you would that you would bless us as we spend time in your word. Lord, that we would see your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word, more and more clearly, that we might be more and more like him. We rejoice in the fact that you have spent your spirit, sent your spirit, your Holy Spirit, into our lives to lead us into all truth. Because that is our desire, is to be walking in the truth. We praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. I say this frequently, but I feel compelled to say it once again. Okay. Don't take my word for anything. No. Test what I say. Test what I say and check it out. Not against how you feel. Not about the traditions of your denomination. Not test it by the word of God. That is the only thing that we know to be holy and true and faithful. All right, as I said, we talked about what a privilege it is to be able to call God our Father. Our Daddy. Our Daddy, Abba, Abba Father. We need to call Him, and we need to call Him by name. Yes. All right? Hallowed be thy name. You know, I, I think, honestly, so many people, Jesus, you know, and Jesus said, don't, don't pray by rote by what you've learned by memory, and just regurgitate the words. And yet, that's so commonly the practice when it comes to this particular prayer, isn't it? So we want to be crying out to Him, calling out to Him, communicating with Him from our hearts, yes. from the depths of our hearts, because He searches our hearts. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. His name is blessed. His name is blessed. Yes, is. The purpose of prayer I've been saying this for weeks, it's not just to talk to God, it is to communicate with Him. The more important part of that being Him speaking to us rather than us speaking to Him. We need to be listening. We need to be listening. So listen to what He says, all right? Yes. The second commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes His name in vain. That's Exodus 20, verse 7. His name is holy, hallowed. What does hallowed mean? It means holy. It means to make something holy. But the thing is, we can't make the name of God holy. No. We can't make God holy. He is holy because He is. That's right. All right? We're not, we're not causing this to happen because we call Him this. We are just recognizing the truth of the, of the matter. And the truth of the matter is that He is holy. God is unique. Mm. Right? He revealed his name up by that burning bush yes. when Moses refused to go into the land of Egypt without knowing the name. Yes. And he said that his name is Yahweh. I am that I am. 
you am not. Mm. But uh, think about this. I mean, this is very important. It is very important. God owes his existence to nobody and nothing. No. We, on the other hand, we exist because of somebody else. You exist because you're a mommy and daddy. I mean, you exist because of your grandparents. You exist because of that, that, that line of people mm -hmm. that you can trace back. Well, in the natural, you can trace it right back to Adam if you're, if you're going to be spiritual about it. God always was and always will be. And he, met, he, is, he owes his existence to nobody. Okay? That's so, we, that's so hard to wrap your head around. Well, it is. And this is why it's important to begin to grasp it. Yeah. Is it everything that we have, we have because we received it. That's what Paul says. That's we have right. nothing that we didn't receive. Mm -hmm. We owe everything in our lives, our very existence, everything that we have, to somebody else. Right. God does not. And it is, um, it is truly important that we come to grasp this truth. Mm -hmm. All right? Because then we wouldn't be treating him like he was just another man. Yeah. Oh, please, don't, don't yes. ever say in my presence the man upstairs. No. No. He is not a man. He, he is not. He is something totally other than us, all right? Jesus Christ, on the other hand, truly God, truly man. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. The name of God is holy. So holy that the Jews of old and the Jews of today, at least observant Jews, won't even pronounce his name, won't even say his name. They call him, you know, they'll say Baruch Hashem, blessed be the name. They call him Hashem, the name. Okay? I, I, in a sense, that's very, I think that's very powerful. Yes, it is. Calling him the name. the name. But by the same token, as much as God's name is revered by the Jews, all right, because they won't, they won't even write it. No. When you write, you watch observant Jews and they'll, they'll write the name, they'll write God, G hyphen D, all right? They won't write it any place other than in Scripture, right? Because it's too holy, all right? The name, Hashem. There should indeed be a reverence for the name of God. But we need to know the name. Knowing the name of someone gives you the power to get their attention. You know, I grew up in New York City in Manhattan. You know, and you walk down the street, it's like, well, it seems like I didn't count at any point in time, but a million people on the street with you. You know, and if you just say, hey, you, what, in New York City, there, ain't, there aren't no yous around because nobody's going to pay attention to you. They just keep on going. If, on the other hand, you were to holler out, hey, Joe, everybody named Joe is going to stop, turn around, and, and give you some attention, right? There is that power in the name, the power to grasp somebody's attention. The name defines the relationship. You know, we need to take time and meditate on the holiness and the power of God's name. Knowing his name, listen to what I'm saying. And like I said, you test it, you check it, and you write this down. Knowing his name is the key to effective prayer. Prayer that has power and effect. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. It says in Psalm 91, verses, I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. You see, God says he will, he set us on high because we know his name. They can, so we can call on him. We can call on him by name. And he will answer. Yes. All right? In, in Ezekiel, that was Psalms 91, by the way, yes. 14 and 15. Did I say that? Yes, you did. Good. Okay. Keep me on track here, girl. In Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, God spoke through him, and he said, My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. All right? God's promise was that he would make his name known. His name is, you know, a lot of people debate this, but the simple fact of the matter is, it, it, it's called a tetragrammaton. There's four letters in, in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Y-H-W-H. That is the name of God. And by the way, this is something that I have wrestled with to some degree over the last 40 years. Because my Bible, the translation that I'm using here, the New American Standard, like most Bibles, will not use that word. They won't. That's true. So they put the, they'll substitute the word Lord for it, typically. 
Well, I understand, and that may be because of reverence, or it may just be because of tradition. Mm -hmm. The simple fact of the matter is, God revealed his name, all right? He did. And he said he would know. This is, this is, think about what I said before, Moses. How many have been called like Moses, the most humble man mm -hmm. of his time, right? It says in Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to, I'm, to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. This is Moses talking to the Lord God Almighty. Now, they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am, Yahweh. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent, you, has sent me to you. This is why the, the Pharisees were so, so upset when they would question Jesus. And he said, like, you know, they're, they're talking about their sons of Abraham. He says, your sons of your father, the devil. But he says, before Abraham was, I am. Okay. You don't go out. Out where? Don't go out any place. Don't go on without knowing the name of God. His name, what's his name? I am. El Shaddai. The Lord God Almighty. His name is Lord. His name is Healer. His name is Provider. His name is Peace. His name is Shepherd. His name is Savior. Mm. And I could go on. He is the Lily of the Valley. He is the Rose of Sharon. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the root and the offspring of, of Jesse. You need to know he's the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. He is the word. Mm. You need to know this because when you call out to him, you know, it helps. If you need healing, call out to him. Call out to him as the healer. He said, I am the Lord that healeth you. He is Yahweh Rapha, the healer. Call him by his name that is pertinent to your situation. He is your provider. You go to him when you need. Listen, he said he would supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But he is your provider. It's like people in the world, if they needed a doctor, they wouldn't call the butcher. Then they wouldn't call the banker. That's That's you're absolutely yeah. right. So it's good to call on him, pertinent to, he is, he is the Lord. You have. Because he can meet, he is the Lord, he is the God of everything you need. Mm -hmm. Right? He is all that you need. Think about that. Everything. He is all that you need. It says in Proverbs 18.10, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Mm. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Mm. With our earthly fathers, there's times when we would call him father out of, out of respect and honor to him. And it's good to honor your father, right? But at other times, at times of greater intimacy, you might call, out him, call him daddy, mm. right? The choice doesn't change the trusting, loving relationship. But it's an indication of the situation. An indication of the situation. God knows what your situation is. He knows what your circumstance is. And he is the answer to every problem, every circumstance that you have. Because he can turn every problem in your life to an adventure in your life, every adventure into a victory, a triumph in your life. Amen. Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. That's a unique and holy name. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Thank you. you know, I, let me tell you this. I promise you. We talked about this last week. Not everybody can call him Father. No, that's right. You did. Not, that's not right. everybody can call him Savior. But everybody will call him Lord. Amen. That's the truth. Yes, it is. Genghis Khan is going to call Jesus Lord. Adolf Hitler is going to call Jesus Lord. Stalin is going to call Jesus Lord. Nero. Nero is going to call Jesus Lord. Julius Caesar, who said he was the Lord. Everybody is going to call Jesus Lord. But you have the option today 
to call him Father. Hallelujah. That name, there is salvation in no one else. There is no under, the other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12, that name, that, that holiness, that salvation in that name is so commonly used. Well, let me just say this. I've been, this has been a pet peeve of mine, and I've been saying this for, for a number of years. You know, Alice and I have been used by the Lord. We've started Christian schools. We've been involved in working with children in a lot of places, although we don't have a children's ministry. <laughs> in the United States of America, and, and President Obama, I hope that you're listening to this. If, if you're not, and somebody knows him, forward this to him. All right? You can walk into any government-run school in the United States of America, and you can say, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You can say it as much as you want, as often as you want, as loud as you want. As long as you're cursing. Profaning. Profaning the name of God. Mm -hmm. Because then that government will stand up and protect your freedom of speech. But should you go into that same school and use that name, that name above all names, and use it as it is supposed to be used, as a call to the one who is wonderful, they'll stop you right away because you're not allowed to be religious. Well, may I never be religious, but I want to, I want to lift up that name. How could that be allowed to have happened? How could it have happened? How could it have happened? And by the way, I don't want to sidetrack myself as I so often do. do. <laughs> I have no freedom of speech. No, God has not she has no freedom of speech. No. And if you are a bond servant of the Most High God, you have no freedom of speech. God has told you that you're responsible for every careless word that comes out of your mouth. That you are to let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. That whatever you speak, you're supposed to speak as it were the oracles of God. You are not free to say whatever you want. No. Even Jesus Christ himself was not. And that's why it says in John chapter 12, he spoke nothing unless he heard it from the Father. That's right. We, you, so many have been so easily deceived. I, I was so blessed, and I shared this before, that when I was, I think, eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere around there, that I learned right away that I had no freedom of speech. I had a yo-yo. My father got me a yo-yo. It was the first yo-yo that I ever had. You could grow down and stay down. You know, they, they call it sleeping. Well, I went out. He gave me this yo-yo, and I went out to the yard, and I threw it down, and it stayed down. I wound it up again, and I threw it down, and it stayed down. So I went into my mother and father, and I thought I would be very, very mature. And I said to my father, this yo-yo doesn't work. Well, I was blowing bubbles for a week. Because they believed in discipline. Washed my mouth out with soap. So I learned that I didn't have freedom of speech. You don't either. Control your tongue. Your tongue guides your life. There are hundreds of scriptures. There are so many scriptures that tell you that. Control what you say. All right. That name. Hallelujah. I just want to say this about prayer. If you look, you know, David was a man after God's own heart, the apple of his eye. David was a man of prayer. David was a man of praise. We've talked about this so often. Go look at the Psalms, 150 Psalms. He didn't write all of them, but follow the pattern through his Psalms. I want to tell you how his prayers, how his prayer life ended up. If you want to know how his prayer life ended up, go look at the last Psalm, Psalm 150. Love that Psalm. Alice is going to look at it. Okay. All right. So, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus said. Yes, it is. Matthew 3 2, among others. The kingdom of God has come upon you, Jesus said. Luke chapter 11, and other places. The kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 21, Jesus said. And the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power, Paul said in Romans, uh, not in Romans, in 1 Corinthians 4, 20. We want to have power-filled prayers going in both directions. What we hear from God, 
Because I'll tell you, his word has power. His word never goes forth without accomplishing his purpose, it says in Isaiah 55. But listen to what God said. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let it start on earth where you are. You want power-filled prayers? Let it start right where you are. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says this. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to serve him. And Paul, in the New Testament, in Romans 12, too, says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. Our prayers must not be about our will. It's about God's kingdom and His will. Stop. It says, you know, Paul said, let a man examine himself. It's our prayer life about going in and saying, God, here's what I want. We tell him what we want and how he should accomplish it. We're talking about our will, what we will. And so many people have dead prayers, prayers that just don't seem to accomplish anything. Although it says the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What makes a prayer effective? Well, I'm going to tell you since you asked. In 1 John 5:14, I'm going to read 14 and 15. Here's what John wrote. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. You have a confidence when you're praying in God's will that it'll be done. That's right. The problem is the reason that so many prayers aren't being answered is because they're not in God's will. You can the prayers of the righteous. Paul was a righteous man. Hallelujah. Believe that. But I can think of a time when he was praying a prayer. Mm -hmm. He was passionately praying this prayer. Believe that. And his prayer was, take this from me, Lord God, this thorn in the flesh that was that was picking at him, picking at him, picking at him. And there was no answer. Paul, what's Paul saying? Why aren't you answering my prayer, God? So he prayed again. And he said, Lord, take this from me. No answer. It, wasn't, it wasn't a very effective prayer. But God, in his mighty love, the next time Paul prayed that prayer, the third time Paul prayed that prayer, and said, Father, take this thorn from me. God finally answered, hallelujah. And he said, no. My grace is sufficient. Amen. God's grace is you see, Paul was praying something outside of God's will. But God, in his amazing grace, mercy. said to Paul that my amazing grace, that grace, is sufficient for you, Paul. God is a God of blessing. God is a God of love. He, was, he is a loving Father. He wants. You see, don't think he's to, if he's not answering your prayer that he's trying to deprive you of something. He said, I can't. You might have life and have it abundantly. He's not trying to keep anything from you. He's trying to give to you. But he's trying to give the things to you that will bless you indeed. Amen. That's the truth. You know, I, I always think of the, the time a, a man, a rich young ruler, came to Jesus and said he wanted to follow Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You, know, you know, I'm sure you know the account. And when Jesus told him, okay, go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the man said he, he couldn't do that. He couldn't, he couldn't do that because those riches were so important to him. Was Jesus trying to deprive him of something? No. no, you know, that account starts with Jesus saying to the man, one thing do you yet lack. Jesus was trying to give to him. Jesus was trying to give to him the thing that he didn't have, the thing that his riches had not provided. Because with all of his riches, he was unsettled, he was unhappy, he was dissatisfied. Isn't that true? That's true. That's why he came to Jesus. The one thing that Jesus could give him was life, and life abundantly. He was trying to give to that man what that man didn't have, not to take from him what he did have. God wants to bless you. He wants to give you. He wants to give you life and life abundantly. But remember, he said, even when a man has abundance, his life doesn't consist of his possessions. It's not about stuff. It is about our relationship with our God. God wants you to have an effective prayer. 
You know, I, I think I've shared this before, but it's, it'll do me well to hear it again. Not long ago, I was asked to preach at a church in uh, Winter Park, Florida, kind of surrounded by Orlando, Florida. And a brother, he wasn't there, the pastor, so he, they'd asked if I would come in and preach. And prior to we, our starting, his wife, his lovely wife Dawn, a dear sister in the Lord, said to the congregation, okay, we're going you know, to stand up. Anybody have needs, and we'll pray for those needs. And I got up and I said, listen, let's just, just hold on a minute. Let me speak first. Let me share with you what God has just given me. And I stood up and said, the reason I did that is because I am utterly convinced that by and large, we don't know what we need. You're going to stand up and say, well, I need this and I need that and I need this worldly thing and that worldly thing. I need a job. I need a house. And all those things may be true. But if you need them, God has already promised. He said, I will. He's going to supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Do you believe him? He watches over his word to perform it. So I said, the one thing that you need is a closer walk with Jesus. The one thing that I need is a closer walk with Jesus. And that's what I spoke about, having that closer walk with Jesus. Do you believe that? That's your need. We need to grow up and mature and understand the difference between what we need and what we want. Because often we don't understand. And the things that we want, the things that we should have, the things that will bless us will come when we have that right relationship. Or have you never heard, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the rest shall be added unto you. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. God has a plan to bless you. He has a desire to bless you. Don't lose sight of that. I mean, sometimes we go before God, and it's like we're pleading and begging to Him to do something nice to us. What are you, crazy? A sound mind is, thank you, Lord. We are to rejoice always. We are to be giving thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Knowing, having confidence that God's desire is to meet all of your needs, that everything in your life, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And this teaching is to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Because when you do that, you know everything will work for your good. And more importantly, far more importantly, it'll work for his glory. Hallelujah. And that, my friend, should be the desire of your heart to see God glorified in your life. That you would have a testimony for the saints overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony because they didn't love their life unto death. That's why we're supposed to have a testimony. That God would be glorified. The man who was born blind, John chapter 9, go read this account. And the, the apostle said as they were walking out of the temple, why is this man blind? What is, was it his sins or his parents' sins? And they're looking to lay the blame. And Jesus said, neither. It is so that the works of God may be displayed in him. Any situation that you're having, when you go in prayer, remember that it's an opportunity for God to be glorified, for his works to be displayed. That's what your life is about. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that you would use us to bring the knowledge of your presence into every place. That fragrant aroma, Lord God. Lord, that people would see your work in our lives. and our, They would see your hand at work in our lives. Lord, that you might be glorified and they might be drawn to you. That they would know the power of your love, the desire that you have to bless, not to curse. We praise you and thank you for being our loving Father. We praise you and thank you, you who sit in heaven, Lord God, and pray that we would surrender our wills and that your will would be done in my heart, that your will would be done in my life, that your will would bring glory to your name through my life. Father, I thank you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. God bless you. Till next time.